Okay, if you can hear us, please let us know. Type in the sign. Let us know where you're from, where you're listening from. And if you're watching us on a recording, welcome to Noble Warrior Life. This is a place where visioneers talk about our hero's journey and what it takes to create a life of purpose, meaning fulfillment, and really dive deeper into how these visioneers engineer their mind and engineer their consciousness specifically. We're going to talk about mindset. We're going to talk about mental models. We're going to talk about actionable tactics so that you can go out and create your own beautiful hero's journey as well. Now, if you have any friends who use um, this conversation specifically around crafting consciousness, go on and share with them so that way they can learn from your discovery. My next guest is a, is a former NFL player. He's the founder of the World Education Foundation and Urban Matrix One. He is also the podcast co-host of Ancestral Cyborg at ancestralcyborg.com. He's a thought leader. He's a keynote speaker. And he's a cyborg and throw. That, that's a mouthful. So help me out. <laughs> cyborg anthropologist. Got right? it. Please welcome Marcus Anderson. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you, CK. Wonderful to be with you and your audience. Thank you so much for being here. So let's actually jump right into it. You have a really interesting background. You went from uh, an NFL player to now a thought leader. If mm -hmm. you can tell us a little bit about that, about that hero's journey, I think that would be really fascinating. Yeah, definitely. You know, so ever since I was little, I always kind of imagined what is possible. Um, and I did that through kind of like this personal meditation that I would do. And it was before I actually knew what meditation was. Um, but ultimately, um, through kind of seeing in this synesthetic type of mentality, I would piece patterns together, right? And I think one of the hardest parts for me growing up was being able to articulate those patterns into this three-dimensional space. But as I got older, I was able to uh, really connect my physiological body with what um, I wanted out of life. So for example, I would ask questions and I would listen to my heart. And if my heart actually was beating fast, I knew it was something that I shouldn't actually uh, move forward with. But if I asked that same question and my heart was slow and there was a contentment around it, then I knew that um, I could move forward and explore that. Um, so kind of using those as my parameters, I came from a family, you know, with athletes, you know, as well as intellects. Um, and then, uh, you know, as I kind of got into college where I went to UCLA, um, I was fortunate enough to play football there. Um, and then I got drafted um, into Green Bay Packers. And it was a great experience. I played for four and a half years and um, I really loved the game of football, just for all of the things that it brought, you know, you could actually prepare, you could, you know, be have access to a lot of information, um, being able to synthesize that information and react um, was a great experience. Uh, but I never felt def defined by being a football player. Um, and I know it was something that I enjoyed doing and I was very fortunate enough to have the abilities to do that. But I also wanted to be intellectually stimulated in a way that football just didn't do it for me. Not saying that you're not intellectual if you play football because this takes a lot of intellect to get to that, to that level. Um, but I think I wanted to combine my freedom with the intellect to actually start to manifest some of the things that I was thinking about when I was younger. Um, and through that, I met a mentor of mine in Denver Broncos by the name of Dirk Van Barkel. And I always like to say his name just due to the fact that, <laughs> you know, it, I think it's important to really understand the mentors and give them their flowers, right? Because they are the ones that almost serve as this connective tissue for us to make these pivots. So um, meeting him was just one of the best things that, that happened to me. And it gave me the confidence to actually leave the, 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 you know, the NFL and start to pursue other things. And I think um, this was kind of the maturation of who I was as a person, but also kind of following my dreams. So I took about a month off. So I pause for one moment, if you don't sure. mind. If you can zoom into that moment to mm -hmm. you, where you met your mentor to making a decision to leave. I'm sure it wasn't as easy as you just like two sentence. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, I'm gonna do that now, right? So you can zoom in on that, and then I wanted to use the your journey also as a as a teaching moment as well, because 
a lot of people right now are going through the ups and downs and you know side to side type of shifting their life and whatever it may be so if you can use your journey as a teaching moment i think would be really really useful definitely yeah you know i think it's 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 all about really understanding what resonates with you and i really kind of lean on indigenous wisdom that i've been able to pattern over the years of the relationality between ourselves and other things um and i think it was important for me to really understand what resonated with me you know and really try to find out what that purpose was you know why was i here what was my meaning in life and what was I to do with the energy that I've been allocated during the time that I've been here. And I've always kind of been on a journey to match that with the things that I'm doing. Um, so, you know, when I was playing football, like it was great. I did great. It felt great. But when I met Dirk, um, Dirk, he was actually at, uh, he was working on a project where he was converting a large aircraft um, into a cargo aircraft. And he was doing all the stress tests and the retrofitting of the doors and uh, doing all the technical aspects to that. So every day after work, you know, I would go visit him and we became really good friends. And I started to understand that he saw me beyond a football player because he was actually transferring wisdom to me. Uh, he was really kind of taking it as a mentor without saying, hey, I'm your mentor. Um, he just supplied knowledge. And as he saw that I sucked it up, you know, he continued to, uh, you know, supply that knowledge. And I think over the course of building a trust you know with someone who is fascinating to you um and that you glean wisdom from i think you start to formulate new perspectives about what's possible you know between yourself as well as the work that you're that you're doing so i advise everyone to try to find a mentor someone that you can lean on not only for the business aspects but just kind of the emotional transformation that you may be making during that time um, having community and kinship is so important to the pivots that you make because you need that support. So even if it's not a family member, you know, find somebody that believes in you as a person and is willing to give of themselves to see you succeed. Um, and that's what I found in Dirk. Um, and I think that's what made it easy for me to make that transition was um, just his recognition of seeing me as a person. Was there, so I want to do a quick recap. Um, so he saw you beyond your your identity as a football player, beyond mm -hmm. whatever that is, he be and believe in you and the possibility that you can rise above to whatever that looks like for your future self, right? So I'm curious to know also, uh, was it smooth sailing or was there internal resistance? No, Derek, I'm not it. You know, I'm not you know enough to step up to you know this 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 idea that i know within me but i don't i don't want to admit to that was there any kind of you know inner resistance that he had to basically hold that space for you in order for you to rise above yeah that's a great question and i, I there, there was resistance you know just because you spend your life getting to a point where you're at the top of your game right and you want to be respected for that and you want to be treated as um you know, a, a fair participant in all of the work that you've done to get there. So the resistance was like, okay, you know, is the NFL what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, they're paying you a, a ton of money. You know, you're actually exposed to a lot of doors being opened, um, you know, and is this the right decision if you move away? You know, and I kind of always lean on this. And one of the main reasons why I chose to leave was because I always was fascinated about other things off the field. So during the off season, you know, in between workouts, I would get involved in different types of projects, you know, and, um, you know, the year before I kind of really lost the passion, um, you know, one of the GMs from the Raiders actually told me, you know, Marcus, you can be in this league as long as you want, but you got to stop doing all the other things off the field. And at that moment, that's when all like physiologically, all of the passion just left my body. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that I needed to make a transition. I knew that, okay, that was a sign for me that I shouldn't be here, but I had to listen to myself. So it was an internal battle. Like, okay, how far do I push this? You know, if I'm not passionate about it anymore, you know, but I'm getting, you know, monetary, um, you know, payment for it. Where's that balance? You know, and when can I actually make that pivot? So I had to really kind of go through that. And that was the resistance. But when I came to the decision and I actually understood that this is somewhere that I wanted to be, um, you know, after football, 
then there was no resistance at all. Like it was smooth. Mm -hmm. I understood that, but it took about maybe six months to really kind of uh, consolidate all of those different perspectives for me. If you don't mind, again, I want to use this as a teaching moment because let's say a lot of people are going through their life journey, their, their face change, their circumstance, relational business, otherwise health, all these things, right? This is happening all the time. Mm -hmm. However, um, you trusted this inner intuition in spite of not having immediate payoff. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so some people advocate for, Hey, just follow your bliss, trust your gut, you know, destroy the ship, burn the ship. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of what you did. <laughs> some people essentially say, Hey, no, you know, stay your job, get the pay. So you can do essentially do a portfolio type of approach, mm -hmm. right? So you can maximize the utility of your cash as well as, you know, you have some back doors and so forth. So, and some people as, uh, as your GM advise you, Hey, double down on this thing, eliminate the, the distraction. So if you can kind of share with us your mental model around how, how you go about doing that you know, even more, I think would be really, uh, really uh, illustrative to other people going through this, you know, forks in the road right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's really about checking in, you know, checking in with yourself um, and really doing that on a regular basis, you know, because the situations change, but it's not necessarily the situations that, um, you know, are determining where you are. You know, I think it's really about a self-evaluation and being critical with who you are and what you want to be um, and being brave enough, right, to make those hard decisions, to be brave enough to know that things are going to work out if I actually get into my alignment. Um, and also brave enough to really suppress the ego, right? Because we all have these egos that identify who we are or who we think we are. But there's also another side of the ego where there's an ego of where society may think you are, right? You know, your friends, your family, um, your coworkers, like, hey, you know, this is where you need to be. This is who you are. This is who I've identified you as. Um, and I think having the bravery to kind of break out of those mental models, you know, to where you can create a new you, you can create new habits, you can create new rituals. Um, I think it's really important to give yourself that capacity in order to do that uh, effectively. Yeah. So personally, for me, I was very, very, I was raised, well, I'm Chinese, I'm raised, you know, hey, you're a scholar, you know, that's, that's where your role is. And it wasn't until I actually came across some really beautiful psycho spiritual tools, personal development tools, which are going to go into a little bit more. Nice. Um, then, then I can really kind of think about my identity as jackets. Like, mm -hmm. oh, if I can, uh, this jacket is too small for me now. This is no longer comfortable anymore. Let me take it off. Mm -hmm. Be naked for a little bit before I try on this new other identity and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And so these type of mental models actually helped me to temporarily or bring that or amp up my courage and willingness to mm -hmm. try on different things. Hence why Noble Warrior Podcast, even though it doesn't <laughs> really make Kind of in any logical sense for me at the time, uh, but I'm doing it right. So I'm curious yeah. to know where, what are some of the practices mm -hmm. that you had or you have mm -hmm. as a way to help quell the ego, mm -hmm. help help you take out the different identities, your jackets to mm -hmm. try on new ones. Yeah, no, I love that analogy. Like that is so good. Um, and I think one of the things as humans, what we kind of fear is being dynamic, right? It's like taking on too much, but not allowing ourselves to be all the things. Like, you know, we can be an artist and a business person. We can be a business person and an activist. We can be an activist and a writer. So all of these things kind of cross merge with one another if we allow them to. And I think they all inform one another because you set these tools up, right? So if I need in business, I need some of my art tools at some point, I have those cachet that I can actually move into that practice. Um, and I think through that, um, it's really important to um, 
ideate and see yourself where you're at right now and where you want to be, you know, to really look at your future self and really ask the hard questions. It's like, how do I actually get there? What are the, what are the rules and the regulations that I need to define for myself? Because they're going to be different for everybody, right? Some people are really disciplined in the way that they move forward. Some people need a little bit of guidance, but if you can find out where you want to be, then you can start piecing together around you what, um, you know, what you need in order to be successful. So that would drive the change that you want to see. Um, so some of the practices that I really got into was really listening to my body, really kind of slowing my breath down um, in a very physiological way, and then asking, breathing in the things that I wanted, right? So if I would take a deep breath, I would breathe in discipline. If I took another deep breath in, I would breathe in humility. If I brought another breath in, I would breathe in peace, you know, uh, uh, humbleness, um, all of these different kind of characteristics that I wanted to really embody. I would take mm -hmm. those words because they have a vibration, right? And you breathe them in. And then, as I mentioned before, I would ask those questions and I would listen to my physiological bodies. My, for me, it was my heart. For other people, it might be their shoulders, it might be their sacral, it might be their chest, you know, but we all have these indicators on our body that will give us and inform us on where we need to be and if we're actually moving in the right direction. So, um, you know, I think slowing things down, not being so hyper engaged, but then also allowing ourselves to be dynamic was really helped me out over the course of time. And then, you know, also the last thing is being patient. You know, I think sometimes we always want to be something and we never sit in the process of becoming, right? So um, as we are becoming, you know, be okay with being dynamic in those aspects and being patient with yourself that the universe is aligning to your provocations. Hmm. So you're speaking to embodiment savant. I, I, I pretty much, you know, my affinity, my, my default is staying the head and it's through cultivation and, and some, you know, transformation on two by four whackings for me. To be like, <laughs> oh, okay. You know, <laughs> the body is very useful and the body is where this 3d dimension material world lies. So therefore I better cultivate some skills of embodiment. So, um, which is, I think as a professional athlete, it's probably you come from a, a body perspective. Again, I don't know, I'm projecting, but I'm curious to know what advice would you have for someone who lives in the head typically mm -hmm. to get into the body more? Mm -hmm. uh, I like that whole idea of breathing, the values, mm -hmm. so you can try on that way of being, like really like visualize that. I love that. Is there anything else tactically that you can advise someone like me who's super cerebral to mm -hmm getting into the body more. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's really about connecting to the spirit, um, you know, as well as the body. I remember sometimes when I was out on the field playing, I would have these out-of-body experiences. It's like, okay, for example, I'll give you a rundown. Like during the week from like Tuesday to Friday, it would be all about learning your opponent, right? Watching film, going over the playbook, um, learning the terminologies, you know, learning the plays and this and the strategy for that week, and taking in all that information. You know, it would be you know week to week, it would change. You know, so you had to have process and protocols on how to actually take in that information and synthesize it in a way that you could react while you're on the field. And what I would do is like really prepare, like do the due diligence in war order to understand where. I wanted to be in during the game time, right? So visualizations, how do I actually like see myself into this into this space so that's more of kind of like the spiritual intellectual side but then when you're on the field like that's when i could embody it right and that's when i could feel and textualize and feel the textures of what i've been preparing for but then when you mesh all of those things together like for me i even had outer body experiences while i was on the field where you just get into this flow state right where you match the mind the body and the spirit where you're just on autonomous you're like one with the universe you're feeling the energies of around you, you know, you, you're just reacting, you're not thinking, you know, you're out of your head, you're really just in your body because you're already prepared. And I think if we can take that into our natural lives where we do the work, we do the preparation, the intellectual side is great, but then when it's time to perform, we just mesh all of those things together, get into this flow state and really create something special. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Mike Tyson's famous quote is, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Essentially, someone who is so so stuck to, to their plan, so cerebral, and mm -hmm. you know, 
and then and you get punched in the face and you're, you're like oh wow the body is in shock mm -hmm. so but, but essentially what i heard you say is hey you have a plan you do the preparation and then when you're in gameplay throw the plan out and then just trust the body that you know that you prepare over time could you um is there anything else around just the state of flow that you wanted to articulate? And then I, I want to emphasize this. I'm talking to you this way, not because necessarily you're a professional athlete, but I'm speaking to all other, you know, all my, my, my listeners, my, my audience who are high performers in their state. And from my point of view, as a podcaster, as a student of this high performance, putting ourselves into a state of flow is a, excellent way a easier way to create you know a life of synchronicity and and to be of the highest service so i'm curious to know if you can unpack the the flow part a little bit more about just how do you put yourself in flow um these mm -hmm. days perhaps yeah so for, for me the way that i get in flow now to be perfectly honest is getting into nature right mm -hmm. because nature is so robust that you have to submit right it's almost like a forced submission you can't control the elements in that aspect but if you are able to kind of get to that point where you are resonating with the things that are around you you know whether you're in a desolate place or an isolated place or if you're in a robust place you know like a green forest in the pacific northwest um you can find that orientation um, and understand your orientation in the long, in the larger part of the ecosystem, right? And if we can feel that, for me at least, you know, nature is the cradler of all things, and it holds the facts and the re resolutions for a lot of our quells that we may go through with one another. Um, so nature is a way that I can activate and really get in contact, you know, with what is important, you know, not only to me but into this larger ecosystem aspect. And I think when we strip away Away from the ego, that's when we can start to understand what our purpose and what our function really is. So, um, you know, sitting in nature, um, you know, uh, for some people, plant medicines work, you know, and really dropping in uh, with, you know, holding a ceremonial type of engagement to expanding the mind, right? And then, you know, taking that and consolidating that into the body and how do I integrate that into my everyday practices? So for me, nature is another way that I can kind of tap into that more um, ancestral, more universal concepts of understanding and being. Okay, awesome. I, I love that. One of our guests, I can't remember who said, nature is the ultimate adaptogen. Because mm. let's say if you're down, nature is going to bring you up. If you're too high, then nature is going to bring you back down. So I mm. love that you talk about nature. Could you make it even more concrete? So mm. like, hey, uh, some people like to go bow hunting or some people like to just walk around it. Some people like to go surfing. Mm -hmm. you know, what are some of your concrete or regular practices as a way to um, utilize, not utilize, be in partnership with nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's really about setting intention. So even before I go on any hike, I set intention of what I want. You know, I ask, you know, the, the wherever place that I'm at, um, you know, to protect me, to guide me, to open up to me, um, and to really leave all of the things that may be hindering me from the best experience that I could possibly have. So I think setting my intention before I actually go into nature is really key for me. And then when I'm in nature, it's really about being humble, right? It's really about accepting the things that come from uh, from nature in order to create the dynamic and I guess, aspects of how do we relate to this tree? Can I take a moment to just stop and look and really reverence in that beauty? Not, you know, this hippie thing about being, you know, the tree hugger or anything, which is great. We need tree huggers, you know, but, you know, for me, it's more about like the recognition that, you know, all of the things that are going wrong in the world but how many things are actually simultaneously going right for this tree to be to be here right now for me to be in communion with this tree or to be in communion with this trail or to you know put in a long days of hard work to get to this alpine lake you know that just opens up into this serene beauty and i think it tests all of these different mechanisms for us of understanding that you know how do we just be a part and be a, a be in mesh you know with the place that we're at and i think when we are, are are in that then nature is allowed to open up to us in a in a really 
concrete way that says, yes, you are correct or no, you are wrong. And mm -hmm. I think when we can listen to that, um, then it would actually open up a lot of things in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So um, I am trained classically as a, as a biomedical engineer, uh, very much of a materialist, reductionist you know, approach to life. And it wasn't until I had my spiritual awakening, plant medicine, all these you know, spiritual practices for me to embrace um, the teachings of, let's say, the I Ching or the Tao Te Ching. And then what I, what, what I realized is that really there's, there's a lot of words to describe the wisdom behind it. Ultimately, it comes down to um, being one, going in with nature rather than going against nature. That's ultimately what it came down to. Mm -hmm. so I'm curious to know for you, from your perspective, has this love for nature always been there or is this, you know, some event happened and have you realized like, oh, you know, nature is so important as a way to help you individually as well as help all of us human species to uh, coexist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I always looked at nature as a technology. Even when I was little, I would look at it as a technology, that it had all of the answers. It had everything that we needed in order to survive, to maintain, um, as well as to create new ways forward. Um, and if you think about it, like, you know, the world is, is just that. I mean, there's no other system or ecosystem that can support human life that we know of right now, right? So we've almost been gifted, but I also kind of look at it as a technology where we are a subgenre of that technology. You know, the earth actually created us in this kind of grand immune system to do something, right? That we have a purpose here, that we need to tap into that technology and really start to understand where our orientation is around that. Um, and I think I've always kind of looked at at that, you know, I would always be outside. My sister would be kind of more of in the books, you know, but I'd be outside, you know, looking at, uh, you know, how a caterpillar, you know, walked across the, 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 the driveway, you know, or, um, you know, how butterflies came seasonally, you know, or, you know, why after, you know, rain, there were, you know, puddles in certain areas, you know, rather than not. Um, and I think through this, this, this inquisitiveness and this curiosity, I started to recognize patterns, right? And there's are, there are natural patterns within the world that we can gleam on, you know, whether we want to talk about the Fibonacci sequence, you know, or, you know, fractals, you know, if we want to talk about, um, you know, these kind of universal concepts that start to unfold when we let go. And I think at a young age, I started to see it as a technology that creates these patterns, that create these systems and these ecosystems that can be tapped into and be mapped over different, um, you know, I guess, schema as, as, as we're approaching, you know, life and whole. I love I'm smiling a lot because you're you're using a lot of geeky terms that I don't normally hear guests speak about. <laughs> <laughs> Schema, data structure, fractals, Fibonacci sequence. I love it. Yeah, we, we dropped in. We dropped in. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry for wearing my little nerd, my little my little nerd hat, man. But, I love it. I love yeah. it. So, okay, so. So ever since you were little, you had a, had a sneaky suspicion that there's something greater. So, mm -hmm. and then, and then now, you know, after your identity shift to step into the, this role, the thought leader as a, as a uh, community builder. So let's actually shift gear a bit. So what, uh, let's see, after your search, cause you've been on, on a search for a while, like 81 countries, you know, all these things, and you have came to the conclusion Actually, you know what? I don't want to spill the beans. Why don't you share with us uh, what <laughs> have you discovered after visiting the planet, all different places as a way to kind of think about our role as human species, as well as how do we actually live in coexistence with nature? Wow. Sure. So one of the one of the, the, the one of the books and the people that really inspired me also to make that transition during that time was a gentleman by the name of Paul Hawken, um, who runs Project Drawdown, um, and he wrote a book around the time that I was making this decision called Natural Capitalism, right? And um, ultimately, that book was the first book that I really read in depth that I had solutions to some of the world's grand challenges. And I think that really inspired me and almost served as my playbook 
uh, moving into Europe. So when I was in Europe, I was only supposed to be there for about three weeks, but it turned out to be 10 months, right? And during that time, I kind of looked at it as this research and development phase where I was, you know, gleaming off of different academians. I was looking at different new technologies. Um, I was studying in uh, aviation research. I was doing different, you know, research and development protocols. Um, and I wanted to be able to articulate what I was actually gleaming from all of these things. So I went back and I got my master's in Lynn Shopping University just so I can kind of have this, this terminology, right? I think language is the coding material for our, our, our world, right? And if we can get the language, then we can create the narrative that can actually build the thing and alchemize the thing that we want to see in this world. So I went back to school. And then while I was writing my thesis, I actually traveled through South America um, for about seven months, really <clears throat> trying to understand with no like kind of large agenda, but really trying to understand what resiliency meant to local communities, what kinship meant to local communities, what regeneration meant to local communities, um, what togetherness meant. Um, and then also, how did they survive millennia of, you know, challenges, right? And I think through that provocation, that's what led me to say, you know what, I want to learn more about this, but I also want to give of myself and the, and the knowledge that, I'm, that I've gleaned over that, that year. So um, I created an organization by the name of the World Education Foundation. And this was really the protocol that helped me to bridge the gap between academic knowledge, uh, modern technology, and local uh, integration, right? And what I was really mindful was as I was kind of expanding, um, you know, my portfolio of places that I had been, is like, how can I actually drop down and give something of myself that's impactful for this community, right? I know what I'm getting out of it, which is the conversations and the ability to, have, you know, be uh, privy to all of these new smells and culture and sound and all these things, but I wanted to give back. And so, what I did was I really tried to build trust with the local community and really drop down and understand what their challenges were in a really authentic way. Um, and I used American football to, around that to introduce and to give back to the kids in the, in, the, in, the, in the communities. And once the elders saw that the kids actually kind of were taking to me, that's when they started opening up. And then that's when we could start to get to the core understanding and the fundamentals of the challenges that were approached. Um, and through that, for example, our first project was in the DR Congo, where we uh, helped rural farmers transport this bark called quinine or kinkina into the main city of Bukavu to be processed into malaria tablets. And mm. from the inception of that project, we were able to create about 400,000 uh, treatments for malaria and create about 100 jobs. Mm. And for me, that was a win. Like for me, that was everything that I ever set out to do was like give of myself, but then also have this impact that's actually changing lives. So, you know, just kind of having that mind frame, you know, while I was, you know, going through these countries um, where I needed to show up authentically um, to them to be in service and almost this service leadership aspect, um, then that, you know, really kind of brought it full circle for me. Mm, mm, mm. So I'm curious because this is, that's, that's one approach to going about it, right? I mean, I'm just putting words in your mouth, so to speak. How I describe it is, you know, uh, wherever you are, plant a seed, let a flower bloom, right? So in, in other words, you let, you know, 81 different organizations bloom, right? Let, let a thousand flower bloom kind of approach versus some of the technologist approach would be, hey, let me figure out what the linchpin solution is. And let me scale that, you know, malaria <clears throat> vaccine as an example, right? Bill mm -hmm. Gates, just let me actually, you know, go after a really big problem versus a very localized problem. Mm -hmm. so I'm curious, I don't have an answer, this is more of a conversation. Sure. So after you've made that impact, and now you're looking at different technologies as a way to, you know, make it more scalable globally. From your perspective, which one approach and how, no, how do you think about these different approaches to, you know, bring that impact that, you know, really mm -hmm. all my listeners desire to have? Sure. So during that time at the World Education Foundation, we came up with this protocol called EDGE, EDGE modeling. 
And EDGE, you know, we broke it down into the acronym of E, D, G, and E, where the first E stands for education, but it's not in the kind of the traditional numeracy and literacy aspect. It's more of education of de-schooling, right? So of unweaving all of the patterns and habits that we are familiar with, right? So we can start to understand and envision a new pathway. And then the D stands for devotion. So this is that ecological learning. So this is when we get back in touch with nature and really understand our orientation to everything uh, that surrounds us. And then the G stands for guidance or the um, ultimately the uh, relationality, the relational learning, right? So how do I relate to um, other things? How do I actually relate to my past and understand where I am now to understand where I'm going? And then the last one is emergence. So this is that experiential learning. This is when you actually learn by doing. So this is when you bring the community members in. This is when you ideate together and then you actually do the thing together. And then it's not a linear type of process, but as you get to that experiential part, you start over again, right? So how do I create these new pathways? How do I forget the old habits and create the new habits? And then every refinement, that's almost like you're making this quantum shift or this quantum leap to a new state of being. Um, and I think that was the model that really kind of held and was the, the, the tethering, you know, or the mesh network that brought all of these different patterns together, right? So this is when you can map ancient wisdom on modern technology and say there are no things that are happening modernly in technology that haven't been ideated or performed in some way before in the past, you know? And how do you use the current language you know, almost as a Trojan horse to start bringing in some more of those ancient practices into where we want to go in the future. So when you can also see these patterns through deep time, then ultimately you can start to ideate what's possible and start to understand what those levers and mechanisms are in order to create that thing in a real way. Yeah. I I, I mean, frankly, when, when I saw that, you, you sent me a little bit of a manifesto video, basically telling about, you know, what's your vision of the world. I, I love particularly that you're integrating um, ancient wisdom mm -hmm. or wisdoms and the modern technologies and future society, future world building, right? Mm -hmm. So I really love how you're bridging all of them because in my mind, that's how my mind works as well. You know, mm -hmm. we have, you know, just cultivated all these beautiful things. We should bring them together as a way to think about the future ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the, the key, I guess, ancient wisdoms that you have come across for you to say, oh, wow, this is really worthwhile. Let's actually incorporate that into and leverage, you know, uh, modern technologies as a way to uh, think about building the future. Yeah. So there's this concept out of Nigeria, Igbo land, um, out of this city about Jos. It's about 1100 uh, miles north of uh, Igbo land. And um, ultimately, they have this concept called Mbari. Um, and Mbari is a artistic expression of reverence, right? So a priest would go through the community and ultimately pick individuals. You couldn't say no, you know, you had to be involved with this community artistic piece, right? And through this artistic piece, you know, you were part of creating something within the village that for one paid reverence to the place and the earth of the village, but also to the queen of the village. And what I found very fascinating about this is that as we are creating this art, as they were creating this art, um, they created this kinship, right? They gave of themselves in a unique way that paid reverence to the, the tight knit um, uh, community building aspects of the thing with the output of creating something for the collective, right? So it's like kind of taking this individual, combining it with, um, with the collective and then creating something from there. You know, um, so Mbari is really about how do we take our individual selves, be of service to the collective and then pay reverence to whatever it is that we're doing. So that's one ancient, ancient wisdom. You also have the Kekak, um, which is, you know, a, a, um, a Southeast Asian um, uh, practice out of Bali where, you know, the men of the community would sit together and they would do this ritual of making a noise like, ha, 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 ha all together in unison, they would sit in a circle and they would do this for one to pay reverence, right? But then also what this would do was 
take take the I out of it and actually put the we in it, that we are all collectively in this together. And I think that's something that um, as humans, we need to understand. And that you can see it playing out even here in America, where I'm sitting right now, is that we're so fragmented, right? Everybody is kind of in their own kind of echo chamber, you know, and having their own um, way of, of viewing the world. But, you know, around natural disasters or around, you know, these major events, we find a way to come together. You know, why can't that be the norm? It's, you know, I believe is that we're not in unison, right? We don't do those practices, um, you know, that the ancients really leaned on in order to create that, that, that collective community. Um, so those are just two, you know, kind of ancient wisdoms uh, that I would be, was able to tap into. I mean, there's more, but, you know, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll put a button in it there. Yeah, I'm sure you could probably write a book or a series of books to just highlight these wisdoms. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, because you're a technologist, you know, you embrace technology as part of a, a way to help you, you know, uh, make larger impacts, let's say. Have you thought about some of these ancient wisdom rituals or concepts and leveraging uh, modern technology to, let's say, you know, uh, build localized communities quickly or, you know, f create that sense of connection to the collective whole, anything like that? Have you sure. adapted to some of these? Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, the way that I like to look at it is that the earth doesn't need saving, right? We need saving. So ultimately, I look at it as a personal transformation that needs to happen before the technological aspect, because technology is only a tool. It's a representation of who we are, right? So if we can kind of agree upon that, then how do we actually change ourselves to create the best tools that are necessary to create the outcomes that we want to see? So what we're doing, uh, me and a partner and some auxiliary people uh, by the name of Ada Paris, who is the co-host on the Ancestral Cyborg, uh, we're coming up with this um, uh, this experience, this spiritual experience in the metaverse, right? This hyper-reality uh, metaverse where we're able to go through this five phase. metaverse again? So the metaverse, yeah, sorry, is a technological simulation of this physical world, right? So it's a digital representation of the world. So you can build on Web3, which is kind of the next iteration of the internet, um, these different envisioned worlds. So if you look at uh, Fortnite, right, people are building uh, these metaverses where they're kind of engaged in these hyper-reality type of structures where they're building. So, um, you know, as we build out these metaverse, we can start running simulations of what is necessary. So what we're doing is actually merging a concept called human design and um, DMT practices where, you know, where we're calling it the, the, the death of, or the, the myth of the ego, right? Where we're dissolving the ego uh, in a way that is hyper-realistic. So it's a five-phase framework where it's leave, um, leave, breathe, uh, 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 grow, flow and ground. And through these kind of steps, what we'll do is go through a practice of deprivation. So kind of taking away the senses, reorientating to self. So it'll be in this cave, right? Like the Kogi caves. And then you won't be able to see anything. Oh, there's a fascinating thing about the caves. And then I'll get back on topic. But, you know, a lot of the ancient wisdoms um, if you look at the parables, a lot of people would go to the cave in order to have these breakthroughs. Um, and what, the reason why they would do that is because we all have melanin in our body. But if you deprive it from the sun and being able to transform uh, that melanin from the sun, then it builds up into our brain and then it dumps. And that basically, when that happens, it is like a DMT overload. So a lot of the ancient wisdom say, sit in, to, sit in the dark until you become the light. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can actually start to formulate these new ideas. And that's why they would come out. So we're creating this scenario in a hyper reality space where we're taking the journeyer through these dissolving of the ego to where they start to understand their orientation in, in themselves. So this is a way to kind of embody those ancient wisdoms, you know, utilizing this more modern technology um, and, and looking at it from a cyborg aspect um, being able to utilize those tools in a seamless way that creates, you know, these new models or new ways of thinking. You, you lost me in the cyborg part. Can you say more about the cyborg? Why did you use that term specifically? 
So Cyborg, you know, um, before I came back to the U.S., I was actually living in Norway from 2007 to 2017, but I got selected to be part of Singularity University. Um, and through that, you know, I started to really start to understand what Cyborg meant, uh, what Singularity was. So I started practicing and started gleaming off a lot of the wisdom from a woman by the name of Donna Haraway, as well as Karen Barad. Um, where they came up with these concepts around new materialism. And this is really leaning off of quantum physics. So for example, when Niels Bohr, he did his slit experiment where he took an atom and he shot it through a slit. And he saw that at some times of his observation, it was a particle and other times it was a wave, right? But what he didn't do is actually account for himself being part of the experiment. So in that, what uh, Cameron Barad and a lot of Donna Haraway with their books and discourse actually talk about is dissolving these boundaries. So, you you know, so that to say, as we are creating technology, technology is also creating us, that there is no separation between us and it, right? So if we look at it from that aspect, that everything is just a, a, an extension of us. So if we look at even the word technology, it comes from the Greek word techna, which means to create or to craft, right? So with that, we've always been dealing with technology. Fire is a technology, shoes are a technology, you know, but how we integrate with those things is really what actually, you know, kind of creates this, um, this cyborg, right? And it's okay to be a cyborg because when we are a cyborg, it's a provocation piece to saying that we aren't separate from anything. We are all intertwined in some way, form or fashion. I see. So the, you, you chose that word specifically because part of your belief, which I believe as well, just to let you know, not only we create technology, but also technology creates us. And I think a great um, a documentary of, of the day that actually talks about the impact of um, unintentional use of technology is the social dilemma, mm -hmm. right? Things are created as a way to optimize our experience that in effect actually uh, make it's making us losing our own sovereignty because we're so, and it also helps uh, divide the nations to different polarized uh, ways because was well, it's designed to um, placate to to help us, you know, to entertain us ultimately. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. really beautiful point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and I, and I think you know, there's a paper that I would maybe implore uh, your audience to check out, just to kind of check out. It's uh, by this, this professor by the name of um, Edwards. And he speaks about um, indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence. And this is really how to lean on the indigenous intelligence to create the systems uh, that we're creating right now. And he did like a full workshop out in Hawaii, um, you know, talking to the indigenous practitioners and elders and actually uh, the technologists within Hawaii, you know, and seeing how do you embed and preserve the language and the culture and the rituals that have been created over time and really embed those into the technological systems. You know, so um, I think technology can be used as like this buzzword, you know, that we're utilizing right now, you know, but the AI that I really lean on is ancestral intelligence, right? Um, and I, yeah, I think- Yeah, about that, what do you mean? So, you know, as we feel and know the world is undergoing like a global evolution, um, you know, which is really integrating developments in biology, materials, information, technologies, really at an accelerating pace, you know, so therefore the future of how humans relate to and intertwine with technology, integrated machines, culture, and the planet is being defined at this very moment. Um, so kind of after synthesizing my learning through this master program, um, my curiosity kept coming back to like really two provocations. Um, you know, what are the similarities and differences between community and kinship? And what does authentic symbiotic relationship with the planet really look like? Um, and I think these questions really kind of provoked larger understandings of how do we how do we get into a place where we're naturally subconsciously building um, with the earth? You know, how do we actually orientate ourselves 
with the relationality in which is deemed of us in order to be part of this larger ecosystem. Um, because there's nothing in the DNA code that says that we have to be here, right? You know, there, 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 there is a thing of evolution where we weren't always here. And then there might've been other civilizations that were similar to us that were here, you know, a billion years ago. Um, but if we can start to understand how we come into a deep resonance with the earth, then that's when we become uh, shameless in being human, right? That's when we can drop all of the the fragility of being human and really start to build on this larger construct that we are part of this larger system. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting that you use the word shameless. Why did you use that word? Yeah, I, I believe there is a shame, you know, of being uh, mortal, right? We have an endoskeleton. I mean, if you scratch us, we bleed, you know, um, all of us kind of come into this world knowing that we may sometime make a transition out of this world, you know, by death or by, you know, uh, you know, other means. And, and I think um, that creates kind of a, a shame or fear that um, a lot of us don't grapple with, right? We don't understand the processes. And so during the time that we think that we need to be here, it's really promoting an extract extractive type of mentality, right? How much can mm -hmm. I take what's in, during, it for, yeah. what's in it for me? You know, mm -hmm. I know that I'm not going to be here. I know that, you know, I'm infallible. I'm, I'm fallible. You know, I know that I'm fragile. So how do I get as much as I possibly can in the amount of time that I have here? Yeah. So there is a shame, you know, in being so fragile you know so we create these narratives that we are grander than life that we are bigger than the universe that we can explore you know anywhere and everywhere you know because we don't want to grapple with the fact that we are part of this this ecosystem you know yeah beautiful a lot of different directions we can go let's see what do we what do we take this conversation and then there's a lot there <laughs> um well, let's actually talk a little bit about because you, you alluded to one practice to to take the I to the we, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I can't, all oh, right, the, the chanting together. Mm -hmm. And I think in some of your other podcasts that you have talked about, essentially, um, that's the approach that you're taking on by flipping Maslow's hierarchy upside down. Mm -hmm. So, versus from the self, right? Physiology, security, sense of belonging, um, self esteems self-actualization mm -hmm. and self-transcendence you want to flip them the other way around so coming from the we first mm -hmm. um so i remember our conversation i wanted to ask you this question that's very counter um counterintuitive to our survival instinct mm -hmm. right because our survival instinct is let me grab my let me take care of my own quote unquote family mm -hmm. community and so on and so on mm -hmm. before i have the extra to take care of others. So I'm curious to know how, how do you plan to flip it around in terms of the actual behavior change that you want to have within yourself as well as the students or people that follow you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is counterintuitive. Um, but then the counterintuitiveness to that is that if there is no planet, there is no me, right? Yeah. So if we don't deal with the larger ecosystem, then that doesn't set the parameters for us to even be here. So um, through, you know, Adas and I's uh, research over the past years, um, you know, we have understood and kind of synthesized the connections between colonialization, capitalism and climate change. Um, and we coined that as the ecological triptych, right? So through this triptych, we identify colonization as the ego. Right. And capitalism is the function that drives the ego or supports the ID in certain ways, you know, where the resulting consequences is climate change. Right. And if we look at it from that matter, uh, when we ask ourselves, what does regeneration mean is really about the reconciliation of the fragments that have been created from our disconnect from the planet. So if we can start to look at the ego aspect of it, what drives the ego and what solidifies the ego, and then the results of that ego, then we can start to break down the ego in a way, or at least the myth of the ego in a way um, that can ultimately usher in this new language and maybe take this more counterintuitive way of approaching ideas to more this intuitive way, right? Really feeling it and embodying it. It's like, hey, that doesn't resonate. Yes, that resonates. Let's move forward from there. Yeah, I, I, I want to make it a little bit more concrete, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. So principally, I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. 
I agree that I see Caitlin is, and then uh, my choices actually has a net impact to the contribution on climate change. Mm -hmm. However, because so distant, it's so reach, you know, unreachable. It's very easy for me to say, yeah, you know, my plastic bag purchasing behavior or whatever, it's not going to make a dent. So mm -hmm. then I can dismiss the pain mm -hmm. because it's easier before I actually make a conscious decision to, as you said, make a contribution towards this regenerative way of living, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm using myself as an example. I'm guilty for sure. So I'm curious now, using me as an example, anyone else, how do you actually make that um, net impact a little bit closer to home? Mm -hmm. So that way they feel the impact, they feel the the cost. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense what I'm trying to articulate? Sure, sure. I mean, I mean, we can see it. I mean, the feedback loops are becoming more and more in real time, right? You know, I mean, we're seeing um, an increase in sea level rise. You know, we're seeing our polar caps actually being melted. We're seeing species actually, you know, disappear at a rapid rate. We're seeing uh, fires, tornadoes. I mean, California just went through a major you know, dry lightning. I mean, come on, you know, like these things have happened in pre prehistoric times, but they're coming back because of this disconnect. So we're seeing them. We're visualizing them, you know, but there's been provocations around this for hundreds of years, right? You know, about climate change. I mean, I know in the 70s, there was a huge movement that was going on around how do we protect our, our climate. So it's not that the the, the actual, um, uh, you know, thought, thought provocation is not there. You know, it's there. The technology is there. It's just how the human psyche actually functions around that, uh, which needs to be explored a little bit further. And to your point, you know, I believe that technical systems are also cultural and social systems, right? So every piece of technology is an expression of culture and social frameworks, right? For understanding and engaging with the world, right? So technical systems designers need to be aware of their own cultural frameworks, uh, socially dominant concepts and the normative ideas um, and really be wary of their biases, you know, that come up with them. But that's a personal thing, right? So how do we actually get people to go through that personal evaluation before they create these machines that are actually going to be making decisions for us? But to, you know, to, to kind of connect that to your point is that, you know, what is the one thing that we can do? Okay, all of these grand things, like, they're, they're okay, right? Approaching these global solutions are okay. But I would implore everybody really right now, especially right now, is to go check on your neighbor, right? Do that one little thing about how can I actually show up for my neighbor? How can I be there for him or her or that family in a meaningful way? And if every neighbor was to do that, then ultimately we would start to get this change where we would ID and say, hey, you think about the same things that I think about. Hey, you know, there's a collective effort that we can make to approach these larger issues. Hey, you know, we have crowdfunding. Let's actually put something together that we can get this larger uh, participation in this, you know, to approach these larger uh, challenges. So I think it starts very local, you know, with what you're doing with your with your own self, what transformation, how are you embodying that with your neighbors, and then collectively we can start to ideate over these larger issues. Yeah, for sure. Confucius has said it very, you know, a few uh, thousand years ago, he, he said, uh, self-mastery, family, country, world, fractal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it starts yeah. from the self. Hence why on this podcast, we dive in deep around these micro moments about why markets make a certain decision, so on and so on. Because in my mind, um, <clears throat> whatever we build is sourced from our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if my mind is fucked up in some way about, oh, you know, so-and-so shouldn't be served, whatever I built would also get amplified and blocked out these subset of people as well. So. So hence why this podcast, I don't know if you get a sense already, it's really all about sovereignty, right? Yeah. How do we actually keep that in, in you know, personal integrity going and as well extending our principle of love and compassion towards such that whatever, whatever we built <clears throat> is in the best possible ways to be conscious moving forward. Because once the ship leaves the dock, so to speak, you know, the founder's intent gets lost along the way after that machinery is built already mm -hmm. so um so but let me actually do a counter argument against of course against yeah. what we're talking about here 
a big part of technology in my mind is an amplifier multiplier of that original intent, right? So hence why I was asking you, I would just make it very direct. If there's any kind of incentive built in that that's in alignment with <clears throat> human nature of mm -hmm. self-preservation, uh, that would make it a lot easier mm -hmm. to um, make, you know, synergistic choices as an example, right? Mm -hmm. So I was curious to know if you have any thoughts in addition to, hey, highlighting the cost of consumer behaviors uh, towards climate change. Is there any sort of incentive infrastructure or in, in, uh, incentive mechanisms that you have thought about such that you can do both at the same mm -hmm. time? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, maybe I can break it down or at least try to approach that and then maybe we can unpack it. Um, sure. You know, but but I think you know, one of the th first things that, that comes up for me is education. You know, I think, you know, these concepts need to be programmed, you know, into our subconscious at an early age. You know, I think through uh, looking at somewhat of neuroscience, you know, we create all of our beliefs, you know, or at least a, a strong sense of personality and self, you know, from zero to seven, right? So when we're in these informative ages, we have to kind of integrate what is possible and make them subconscious habits in order to just say, hey, this is how the world works, right? So I think that starts with in, of, of an integration of education that really starts to play as this we concept, right? They do it in the indigenous cultures, right? Where they grow up and in some cultures, they'll send their children out into the wilderness or out into nature and they'll fend for themselves. And then whatever they're good at, that's what they would actually pursue, right? Because they understood what their orientation and what naturally came to them. And I think we need to embody some of that in these structures of capitalism that we need to break down these silos of saying, hey, this is what you need to learn. This is how you need to think. This is what, you know, the structures of, 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 of success look like in order for you to be within the society um, uh, and have some type of meaningful life. But if we kind of back up and say, what are the best things that you can actually offer to the world? You know, what are the best, you know, skills and 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 gifts that you have to give and move from that aspect? Then I think that could start to make a transition in this larger uh, aspect of of what it means to be here. So if you don't mind, let's say get, make it a little bit more concrete. I'm going to, I'm going to ch lovingly challenge you a bit. Okay. Cool. So, so do you, do you see it as more like a nonprofit YouTube program or more of a, in your head, let's incorporate that as part of our traditional education system or, you know, F all of that, let's say she's creating, you know, something that's brand new, uh, charter schools or whatever, whatever as a way to, you know, that, that, that follows this particular philosophy. Like what's your way? since you've been thinking about it for a while what's your way as a way to what you know a, a entry point mm -hmm. for, I think for it's, the parents that want it right i think it's all of the things that you just mentioned right you know i don't think it needs to be one or the other i think it needs to be a consolidation of all those things uh where it's practical intellectual education you know and i think a, there's a lot of things in there you know one of the things that the world education foundation what we really like to do was mobilize the solutions that were in the academic space the, the technology is there to actually create an equitable world you know it's really the motivations and the triggers you know that we need to kind of get in line with as a human behavior aspect um in order to activate those solutions right so the, the you know it is an education piece but it's also an embodiment piece where we hold ourselves accountable for self as well as you know to the community at large um and i think it's also about the narratives in which we create you know the stories that we tell one another you know ever since you know, humans have been on this planet communicating with one another. We've been oratory people. We've shared stories, which ultimately are the coding material for our cultures, right? So the things that we consume, you know, and when I say consumption, I'm talking about eating. I'm talking about listening. I'm talking about watching. I'm talking about embodying. All of those things are consumption. So being very mindful of what we're taking into our bodies that actually changes the cellular makeup of who we are as people, right? Um, I know, uh, Momoto, he did an experiment with the water where, you know, he had water and he, you know, spoke loving affirmations to one bottle and he told disgusting affirmations to the next. And the crystallization within each of those actually changed just due to the vibration of what he was saying and the intent that he was saying it in. 
Um, so I think that, you know the education aspect is is important, but I think it's also the practice that's important for people. You know, to find that thing that they can find that's greater than them, that they can pray reverence to, that it they're getting away from the ego and really doing the hard work of of, of suppressing the ego as they're trying to uh, make sense of the larger larger things in the world. Thank you for that. So uh, I want to ask you your personal practices for personal uh, transformation, as well as a way to maintain your own sovereignty before moving to some of the other more of a commercial things that you're doing. Is that, is that cool with you? Of course. Definitely. Awesome. So what are some of the practices that you do as a way to maintain your own sovereignty, your, your, your own equanimity, your own consciousness, mm -hmm. so that you navigate this, um, shall we say, chaos of a world mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. the time. so mm -hmm. what are the practices that you have yeah so qigong uh is one of them um, oh, no any specific yeah. kind? what's that any specific kind um you, you know so we're, we're looking at um kind of the, the 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 so for example let me run you through one of my practices right so mm -hmm. ultimately what i would do like every morning for probably about a year and a half straight, I would get up and I would like look at a tree. Like I would ultimately find a tree that I could stare at. And I would stare at that tree for multiple hours while the sun was 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 coming up. And through that, I saw that there was a connection between me and um that 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 tree that connected me to my own life force, right? And then through Right after that, I would get into like Qi Kung um, or Qi Gung uh, aspects where, you know, the coordinated postures of the movement, the breathing and the meditation, you know, I use that to really kind of tap into my personal health, but also my sp spirituality and then also just movement, right? So these basic movements of understanding, like how do I flow in this space and time from having an orientation that I'm connected to everything, right? And then ultimately gaining that life force and bringing it into my sacral and holding that energy of that of that ball inside half of me and then outside half of me, which was another connector of who I was embodied and then kind of this larger life force that, that can be created. So to kind of just bring it down, you know, I would really kind of get into uh, those aspects of how do I channel my life force? How do I check in with my personal health? How do I uh, check in with my spirituality? Mm -hmm. mm, I love it. And, and do you have any practices around plant medicine or anything like that as a way? So I'll, I'll share my first. So I, I practice plant medicine regularly as a way to um, do a check, check in on what is my illusion and what, what is my truth. So that mm -hmm. way I continually practice that as a way to, you know, tap it, tap into hyper reality. So mm -hmm. that's part of my practice as well. So I'm curious to know if you have any like quarterly or annually uh, type of practices. Or, around yeah. You know, I don't, I don't schedule them per se, you know, but I do drop in when I'm called, you know, and I kind of look at those opportunities as a place to really connect. And I think, you know, just utilizing us from that natural aspect, I'm always right where I need to be. Right. So, um, you know, when I drop in with friends, you know, we might, you know, you know, kind of get into some plant medicine before we go into the forest. Right. Um, back when I was traveling throughout South America, I was able to um, be with and sit with some shamans, you know, in the Amazon. Uh, to really drop in and be with them. You know, I've done sweat lodges with the Hopi tribes. You know, I've done breathing techniques um, that kind of open up the lungs and kind of get us into different, um, you know, meditations and, and ways of, of being and thinking and feeling. Um, and, I, and, and I look at it as, you know, it's all about intent, right? You know, so if we do these practices, how do we set our intent to be present with the medicine, right? So when we set our intent, you know, then that opens up a lot of different um, aspects of uh, of connectivity. So, for example, one of my last ceremonies, um, I was able to drop in, but then at one point I went into the bathroom and I looked at myself in the mirror, right? And my eyes like stayed the same, but my face 
like it went through all of my lineage. Like I could see myself being old. I could see myself being young. I could see myself in the past. I could see myself in the future. And it was almost like these hyper reality type of structures, like these indigo and purple structures that were like hieroglyphics that were on my face, right? So now that gave me a really deeper perspective of one of deep time, but also of my ancestral lineage, right? That all the things that have come before me have held the water for me being here right now, right? And that strengthened that. And understanding that there's been so many people that have laid the way, you know, for you to have this experience, you're responsible, right? You're responsible to hold that lineage in a way that creates something special that will last. So that gave me the prov provocation of in everything that I do, what type of ancestor do I want to be, mm. right? So if I ask myself what type of ancestor I want to be, then all of those decisions that I make those micro decisions that I make on a day to day basis, they have some a parameter to align with, right? So, mm -hmm. is this the type of ancestor I want to be? Is this what I want to live with my lineage? Mm -hmm. um, and I think from there, we can start making some different uh, decisions. Thank you. That provides a much richer context to the name of your podcast, Ewan. So, thank you for that. I appreciate <laughs> yeah, indeed. indeed. I, I think I think uh, uh, a lot of people think about, you know, who am I being for as a husband or wife or as a father, or as a mother, so on and so forth. But you go beyond that, you know, what kind of ancestor do I want to be? What kind of legacy do I want to have? So beautiful. So regarding that, I'm watching the time as well. So uh, let's actually talk a little bit more about what you're up to with some of, you know, combining the ideas of, uh, you know, ancient wisdoms and, and your understanding of modern technologies. Uh, share with us some of the, the, the cool things that you're doing, uh, for example. Uh, yeah. One is a, is a one thing uh, or, yeah. or your satellite things. So share with us, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that I'm working on, well, there's three things. There's uh, space, there's land, and then there's, you know, the voice, the language part, right? So in the space aspect, um, out of singularity, we were kind of tasked to come up with a business around climate change. So I came up with a uh, understanding of how do we combine um, or these exponential technologies like satellites, uh, machine learning, unique data sets to quantify the sustainability for infrastructure projects, for global infrastructure projects. So we're talking about um, energy uh, systems, wastewater management systems, roads, any type of utility that goes into building a city, we want to be able to quantify that not only in its economic straits, but also in its social uh, as well as its environmental impact. And the social, we're making correlations to the sustainable development goals that were mandated by the UN. Um, and then from the environmental aspect, we're being able to use different protocols to find missing data layers and also do change detection um, that can start to see and map, you know, what uh, a place looked like before the intervention and then also track after uh, what it looks like. Um, and I think through that vertically, what we're doing is we're launching a, a satellite, um, a small 6U satellite just to do a proof of concept. But ultimately, the value add would be to add a hyperspectral imaging camera where a hyperspectral imaging camera can get 3000 bands. So every particle, every element on this planet has a reflective rate. So so every element has a unique uh, reflective rate of the sun's light. So through that, you can identify what that element actually is through that reflective gradient. Mm. Um, and yeah, so with that, uh, you know, it would be almost like taking an MRI of the world. Right. So we can understand what the vulnerabilities are and make interventions more um, with a more strategic, I'd say, output. And it's also to inform capital markets of what they're investing in. Right. Right now, sustainability is like coal mine. No. Yeah. Renewable energy. Yes. And that's about as far as it goes. But if we can start to really dig deep and like, how does that relate to access to education? How does it look at child mortality? How does it look like at the world index? How does it look like at the happiness index? You know, how do we start to kind of look at these more holistic ways of quantifying what value is? Um, so that's kind of the space. Um, and then land, we're working on. A you might I ask you a quick question before you go into land. Sure, so, sure. That's an admirable project. I love it. You're essentially creating a, a real time MRI for to identify vulnerable or vulnerability places. Mm -hmm. How does the economics works there? Is it 
hey, I have this much data, let me sell it back to the nation or to the state or to the real estate development projects. I don't quite understand, like how does that incentive infrastructure yeah. stuff work? So, so the stakeholders would be project developers, um, insurance companies, um, pension funds, um, you know, even academians, um, you know, miners, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of different stakeholders that could actually utilize this data. So for example, in Africa, um, you know, they don't have the census data that we have, right? So one case study we did in Rwanda was being able to actually simulate putting, uh, you know, whatever megawatt um, distribu distributing um, electricity grid in a place in Rwanda, and we were able to make correlations to what the social impact and the environmental impact would be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if you come over to the States, so, uh, just one more thing about like Africa, we can make, you know, wealth uh, correlations by looking at night lights. So looking at energy. So looking at satellites from night, where are the places that are lit up, where are the places that aren't would give an indication of where there's electricity and electricity has correlations to wealth and wealth has uh, correlations to education and access to education. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, through that, you know, moving that over to like, say, a North American concept, um, a lot of these municipalities throughout uh, the nation need uh, climate resiliency plans, right? So it's really expensive for to hire consultants to go across, you know, say, let's, let's put some arbitrary state and say Kansas, right? And look at all the rules and saying, okay, that's vulnerable to a category four, category five hurricane, right? Uh, or I'm sorry, a tornado. So, you know, what we would be able to do with satellite imagery is being able to map you know, that whole scenario and see where the vulnerabilities are within that community so they can actually plan where do they need to have distributed energy? Where, if this, you know, category five tornado were to come through here, um, where are the deployments of, of hospitals, you know, or, you know, are the hospitals actually equipped um, to, you know, sustain uh, a category four uh, hurricane? So, you know, even with missing data layers, or we could look at particles in the world, you know, in the earth, um, you know, what they call, you know, volatile. Mm -hmm. um, so think, yeah, there's a lot of different case studies that we can that we can get to, and there's a lot of different stakeholders where this information. Yeah, we can probably out. geek out about this very topic for another hour. So uh, you were gonna talk about land usage, go ahead. Sure. Talk. So, so kind of connecting those things, how do we actually put this information into practice? And I think, you know, what we did uh, over the summer was um, really drive through the American West, talking to large landowners and seeing if they would be willing to transform into more regenerative practices. And um, seemingly a lot of them were. So we created this company called Regenerative Futures, where we'll be working with a large ranch uh, in the greater Yellowstone region, where we'll almost serve as um, a framework for this temple of regeneration, where we'll, for the first half of this ceremony uh, or, or of the offering, we'll do self um, evaluation and really connecting to the land. So really self transformation, right? And then after that, what we'll focus on is four different verticals, an artistic expression, an emerging technology, a civic solution, as well as rethinking policy. And when we're talking about these things, we're not talking about it just as one plot of land, but we're talking about the bioregion, right? The natural boundaries that are created in these spaces. So we're including keystone animals. We're, we're looking at, you know, is there a soul regeneration project? Is there a manufacturing project? Is there a, re uh, a reintroducing of an animal uh, into that land? So for example, um, cows are not necessarily uh, indigenous to America. It's a European species. So their hooves actually press down the soil when they're actually grazing. But bison, they have a three prong hoof that naturally tills the land, you know, and actually creates this, the, the microbes, you know, within the soil that regenerates it. So even reintroducing these more ancestral species into these places could serve. But you know, we do the personal transformation and then we understand and we ask what, what is needed from that space. Mm. So, mm. and then I the whole, con did, did this one more thing, just, you know, the whole concept is to, from there, create these distributed networks of these labs across the U S where you can drop in and have these experimentations, uh, on land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so do the landowners come to you or you go to them? Like, cause essentially if I'm, again, I'm simplifying this, 
in my head, right? So, mm -hmm. pardon, pardon me if this this is not what you're intending. In my mind, they wanted to they 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 believe in your philosophy. They want to have the optimal you know use of their land in a way that serves themselves, the ecosystem, and ultimately the world. So so then so then they they come to you as a consulting group to help them do that. Is that an accurate reflection of what you guys are doing? It is, you know, and, and I think it's a combination of both of those things that you said. Um, it is, you know, dropping down and kind of asking, are people actually willing to do these types of things? And then once you get that first um, kind of proof of concept, then uh, what we found is as we're creating these frameworks, other people want to get involved. Like, for example, in Wyoming, there's a lot of ranches um, where it's a big deal, you know, to start thinking about these things. Um, and, you know, some uh, farmers have been kind of traditionally doing the same things that they've been doing over, you know, 100, 200 years, you know, so introducing these new ways of being sometimes is an educational piece, but then it's also as they see the successes from one space, then they say like, oh, hey, you know, maybe I can get involved with that and see, you know, where that can take us. So I think it's a mixture of, you know, introducing the concept, but it's also the word of mouth will start to grow and saying, hey, these things are possible. Oh, that's beautiful. Hey, um, Please share with us, you know, where would you like our audience to go on your website? Do you want to go to your podcast? Where would you like them to go? If they're interested in your philosophy, what you're up to, all yeah. the projects that you have going on. Yeah. So to start off with, you know, Ancestral Cyborg um, is going to be our uh, podcast. We launched something with one of my good friends, Yes Lady Phoenix. Um, uh, for Crypto Basel uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we have that in the can. And then as the new year turns, we're going to start having more of those conversations. So AncestralCyborg.com. Um, and then you also have UrbanMatrix1.com if you're interested in the kind of like space and, and geo uh, sciences. Um, and then, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, you know, at Marcus Anderson, if there's any provocations. Um, I currently have my Instagram blocked or closed, uh, but you can find me there at Global Papa smurf g-l-o-b-a-l-p-o-p-p-a -P -P smurf s-m-u-r-f so um, those are the places that you can yeah get in contact beautiful i'll make sure that they're all in the show notes and i want to just take a moment to really acknowledge you marcus and just really thank you for being the kind of person who is willing to have you know very in-depth conversation and uh, dance with me in <laughs> a very interesting way uh, i really appreciate you sharing about your history as a professional athlete, your your practice to get into flow, as well as what vision that you have, you know, after studying with you know, 81 different countries and what it actually takes to create this sustainable uh, future for all mankind. Um, really, really appreciate just, um, yeah. And also actually one other thing, I wanna make a note of it, just, just like your words, like so poetic. <laughs> 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 you are like the best evangelist for all these brilliant uh, ideas and from the ancient wisdom to the ma uh, modern technologies to bring them all together. So whatever you do, keep doing it because you're, you're really, really good at it. Thank I you. Re I really appreciate that, CK. And, and, you know, one thing that I want to mention is that, you know, I can't do this alone, you know. So as we go through these modalities, people like you that are actually doing the work of getting these narratives out, you know, you you deserve your flowers as well, you know, because it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to bring it into the world. And you are that catalyst that is bringing this into the world. Um, and then also, you know, people that are involved, I know it's not an island, you know, I might have had my own personal experiences, but there's been people that have been working on this a lot longer than I have that I'm willing and able, you know, to work with. So as we kind of go on this journey, you know, I'm, I'm really open to, to working with different brilliant minds around these concepts. Beautiful, Marcus. Until next time, we jam again. Appreciate it. Thanks, CK.